uh, we are here talking about statistics and um, types of data with Dr. Granoff, who's going to dig in a little bit deeper, give us his perspective on um, the different types of statistical tests. So let's start with a quick review of where we've been before, and then we'll dive right into all of the different tests that are out there. Dr. Granoff? Thanks, Dr. Clark. How I'd like to start, we've got two parts to today's uh, lecture. One is just a review of types of data, and hopefully I can provide in some nuances and stuff that's beyond what you have in your textbook. And then uh, we're going to talk about what tests to do where, and we have a chart to go through, and that'll probably save a lot of confusion right there. Okay. Yeah, for sure. So most people have had in their beginning stats class of types of measurement of nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. And as you can see here on yeah. the screen, I, I've got examples of each. Yep. Now, I split up nominal into two things. When you only have two groups, for example, male, female, Caucasians, others, you know, yes, no, experimental control, or we have three or more groups, for example, Caucasian, Hispanic, others, yes, unsure, no, USA, Mexico, Canada. The reason I'm splitting that up is there's different tests that are available depending on how many categories there are. Interesting. Right. Okay. I was about to ask why, why you split it up that way. All right. Now, then we have, so I kind of put nominal by itself and we could even sort of draw a line on, on row 14 here. There's nominal, then there's everything else. Mm, okay. Not, when, when you have nominal, all you can do is count it. You okay. typically can't say this is better than that. You can't do any sort of real math on it other than say, this is how many males you have and what the percentage is. Gotcha. So this would be Every considered the categorical data. Yes, nominal okay. and categorical, the same thing. We have multiple names for job security for statisticians. So <laughs> there's that. Okay. Uh, below the line 14, everything here is in some level of order from low to high, uh, bigger or smaller than a bread box, something or other. And the farther we go down, the more precise the measurement is. Yeah, okay. Ordinal level data, you can say something's higher than higher than something else, but there's not a lot of precision. The classic ordinal variable is a Likert scale, which would be things like strongly disagree to strongly agree, never to always, um, poor quality all the way up to excellent quality, things like that. Right. Age groupings. I used to work in healthcare back in the day, and we would split patients up into four categories. If they were less than a year old, they were a newborn. One to 17, they were a child. 18 to 64, they're an adult. 65 plus, they're a senior citizen. Okay. Now you can see it goes from younger to older, but those categories are of different sizes. Right. So it's not all that precise. The next level of data would be interval. Most psych tests that are created would be considered interval level data. If you had age groupings, you know, zero to nine, 10 to 19, 20 to 29, et cetera, right. precise intervals for that. The highest level is what's called ratio, which there is an actual zero. And uh -huh. it's, it's sort of like the name says, a ratio level data, you can create a ratio of two things. You know, Bill is 10 years old, Mike is five, Bill is twice as old as Mike. Now, uh, the example I usually like to use is my age, I'm 64 years old, and we could measure it in different ways and notice how the precision changes. Mm. We could ask the question, and it's often done in human resources, you know, Tom, are you over 18 years old? And of course I would say yes. Um, you know, and that's the ordinal. That, that's the nominal. Oh, yes, yeah, yes okay. No. Yep, yep, that's right. Um, looking at the ordinal level data, I'm 64, so I'm at the very, 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 very top of that 18 to 64 range. 
Makes sense. Interval level, oh, I'm 60 something. And then my actual age is 64. Now, one of the things is if you can measure something at a higher level of precision, interval or ratio, you can then chunk it down into to high, you know, into, into less, uh, uh, less accurate categories, but you can't go the other way. So sometimes the question becomes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I like to invent words. I'm gonna call something ordinal-ish <laughs> or interval-ish. <laughs> okay. Okay. Ordinal, and sometimes you have to decide whether you're gonna do a ordinal level analysis, which is sometimes referred to as non-parametric test, or an interval-ish analysis, which is a parametric test. Mm. Ordinal data, ordinal-ish data tends to be a smaller sample. Okay. Tends to be less precise less reliable or accurate. So if you ask them the same question later, they may or may not give the same answer. If I said, hey, Dr. Clark, how are you feeling today? She goes, oh, I'm an eight out of a 10 today. And maybe if I asked her at the end of today, after she's heard me prattle along on statistics, she may say she's a six. So <laughs> it's not as precise. So it is ordinal-ish. Now, interval-ish is kind of the opposite of that where you've got larger samples, you've got more precise data, you've got data that meets the assumptions, whether you're, yeah. you use something like the layered statistics website or something else, but that tends to, uh, that, that tends to be something to be helpful. Whereas you try to do interval or ratio level data, but sometimes you gotta go back down to ordinal and there's tests for that. So as we go through our little chart, I'm going to talk about what it is if it's really or really ordinal, which I refer to as ordinal-ish. So, Dr. Okay. Clark, if you could go up to the top, please. Sure. Ah, the fun stuff. All right. So this is kind of plug and play. Okay. In that, if you have, if you know what kind of data you're working with, then you just go, oh, then I'm doing this test. Oh, I'm doing that test. Oh, I'm doing this other test. So if we look there in cell 2B. So here. Right. Okay. We can see that one of the variables is two group nominal, maybe male, female. Okay. And the other variable is two groups. Maybe did they complete the program? Yes or no. Now, uh, this okay. Is so wait. Hold on just a second. So Fine. column A represents one variable and column mm -hmm. and or row, row one represents the second variable. Good clarification, yeah. Okay, awesome, okay. So what's in cell 2B is the chi-square test. And I okay. like to think of chi-square as square boxes. How many are in each box? If we oh, have male yeah. and female, yes or no, we've got four boxes. And the chi-square compares the percentage that are in each box to see if there's significant differences or not. Interesting, okay. Now, also you'll notice in there's what's called the phi coefficient. The phi coefficient is the Pearson correlation between two nominal variables. Okay. It gives us a measure of the strength of the relationship. And it also gives you a measure of the effect size. Okay. The general rule of thumb for weak, moderate, and strong correlations, which includes the phi coefficient, a weak correlation is about 0.10, moderate is about 0.30, strong is about 0.50. Okay. So to recap, if you've got two group nominal with a two group nominal, which is what we have in cell 2B, for B2, I should say, we use a chi-square test, and often it's good to have a phi coefficient to get the strength of the relationship. Interesting, okay. So now you going, would probably run both of those. Is that what you're saying? Well, actually in SPSS, it provides both for you automatically. Awesome, even better. Even better, such okay. a deal. All right, 
cell C2, now one of the variables is three group three groups. Mm. So it could be we've got three different racial ethnic groups. We've got white, black, and Hispanic. Or, you know, do they work in the sales department or manufacturing or accounting? Something like that. With row two, we still have a two-group nominal. Now we've got if there's three, if there's three groups, we now have six boxes. Yep, makes sense. And so again, the same idea with a chi square. We're looking to see if there's a disproportionate amount in one group compared to the others. And like I said, chi square compares percentages to see if there's significant differences. Okay. Now, if you've got three or more groups, the name of the, the, the effect size test is the Kramer's V, which SPSS also provides automatically for you. Okay. It, it, it's the same rules, weak, moderate, strong, 0 0.10, 0 0.30, or 0.50. The formula is just slightly different when you've got three or more groups. Hmm, okay. Okay. So now we're going over to D2, where we've got um, some ordinal scales or interval or ratio level data. Uh -huh. And then we've got two groups. Let's just say we're keeping with the male-female thing. Yep. This would be a t-test. Yep. And the t-test is the average of one group compared to the average of the other. And I like to think of it like a t, uh, you know, like Lady Liberty and Justice, you've got the scale with the two box, the two things in it. Yep. You want to see is one mean heavier or larger than the other. That's, yep. that's kind of a T. You got the horizontal in that. And this is actually what I did for my study. I was looking at two groups. Yeah. Those that work mostly at home, those work mostly at the hospital uh in the office, not the hospital. Yes. And then my um scale was or my my other variable was work engagement. Okay. So based on so, the groups, how did their work engagement differ? All right. So let me just add a little bit because it opens up the door for independent and dependent variables. Mm, okay. Inde how, I, how I teach independent variables is the word independent starts with the letter I. So do the okay. words influence, and impact, independent, influence, impact. In Dr. Clark's study, where she's looking at whether they work at home or in the office, and then work engagement, we're saying where they work is going to impact mm -hmm. their level of work engagement. So you could say that the where they work is an impactor, if I can use that word, mm -hmm. variable. Yeah. And then the outcome or the dependent variable is work engagement. So we're saying their work engagement will depend mm -hmm. on where they work. Yep. That's a great way to explain it. Thanks. Now, right below the t-test there, it says point by serial correlation. Point by serial correlation is the Pearson correlation. Huh? between a dichotomous variable and a continuous variable. So yep. for Dr. Clark's study, the dichotomous variable, of course, is where they work. Right? Did they work at home right. or did they work in the office? The continuous variable is the work engagement scale. Right. The point by serial correlation gives you the exact same p-value as does the t-test, because they're based on the same general linear model math. Okay. However. If you do it as a point by serial correlation, it takes up a whole lot less space on the page because there's a correlation with a decimal point and 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 two numbers. It's just like point something something. Where if you do a t test, you typically say the two groups, the sample sizes, the means, the standard deviation, the t statistic, and the p value. Mm, okay, gives the same answer. Now when we do it as a correlation. Often professors want you to have what are referred to as relationship hypotheses. 
Yes. Is there a okay. relationship between work location and work engagement? Now, if we did it as a t-test, it'd say, is there a difference in work engagement right. based on location? They give the exact same result. Now, here's a little bit of a quirk. Uh, many people use a, a software package called G-Power mm -hmm. to come up with the power analysis for their study. If you do it as a point by serial correlation, G power says you need 84 folks. If you do it as a T test, G power says you need a 128. Do I know why? Nope. My doctorate's in clinical psychology. I'll tell you how I feel about that, but I don't know the, the internal math for that. That's a question for the methodologist. That's interesting. But some people say, oh, we need to do differences. Nope, you actually can do it as relations. Can do it, yeah. Now, perhaps it's for another video. If you did it as linear regression, does work location predict job engagement? Then you'd only need a sample of 55, and that gives the exact same result. Interesting. And if you're working with a unique group of people where it's hard to get folks, getting 55 is a whole lot easier than trying to get 128. Right. That's interesting. And that's actually, you bring up a point that something that I realized um, as I was doing my data analysis is that there's a number of different tests that you can do for the for whatever variables that you're working on that will potentially give you the same results. Um, mm -hmm. My, again, another example from mine, I ran the t-test, but it failed one of my assumptions. So we did the Mann-Whitney test yes. just to double check it. And I ended up reporting the Mann-Whitney test, but it was the exact same answer that I got from the t-test. Mm-hmm. So th that, that was, was just something that was kind of an eye opener for me in data analysis. I didn't realize that, you know, if I did a different test, my expectation for some reason was that I would get a different answer. And that's not really the case. That difference between the t-test and the man Whitney becomes less and less the larger the sample is. Mm. Yeah. Do you remember how big your sample was? It was huge. It was 400 and. Oh, yeah. They probably give almost exactly the same. Yeah, it was like 430, I believe. Very Particularly cool. when you do, and this is just another, I mean, it's not exactly stats, it's research methods, but particularly if you have a large sample, it's important to also do a measure of the strength of the relationship, whether you use a phi coefficient or Kramer's V or an eta coefficient or something like that. Because what will happen is you could have something that's statistically significant but not organizationally relevant. Mm. It could be statistically significant, but not organizationally relevant. So with Dr. Clark's study, where she's got over 400, there, there, might be a huge, there might be all sorts of significance all over the place, but there's only a slight difference between the groups. So you say, well, well Tom, when does it become organizationally relevant? Now, I can't give you a journal citation, but I typically say if it's a medium effect size, meaning if, the, if it it's about 0.30 or above, then you probably got something kind of interesting. Okay. Yep. Very cool. <clears throat> All right. So, so now let's, we're go ahead. I was just going to say, let's talk about the, the next row. All right. So row three, uh, you know, B cell B2 and B3 are the same because they're both looking at nominal data, mm -hmm. as in cell C2 and C3. Yep. Now, cell D3 is a little bit different where we have the one-way ANOVA with the ETA coefficient. And the one-way ANOVA looks at the average between three or more groups to see if there's significant differences. ANOVA stands for Analysis of Variance. 
Okay. I like to replace the word variance with the word reasons. Analysis of reasons. Whatever your independent variable is, you're saying, is that a reason why there's differences between the groups? Mm, interesting. Okay. Now, if you, if you have only two groups, like in Dr. Clark's study, you could use a t-test or a one-way ANOVA and it would give you the same result. Okay. Why would you do one over the other? Because um, part of why I asked that is it was suggested to me that I consider doing the one-way ANOVA instead of the t-test. Well, it'd give the same answer. Okay, just a different, just a different approach. The only slight advantage that might having with the t-test over a one-way ANOVA there would be that with the t-test, it tells the reader there's only two groups. Ah, uh, okay. But that should be self-evident from your tables. Yeah, that makes sense. But if you only got two groups, they give the they actually give the exact same answer. If you did it with a t-test and you did it with a ANOVA, ANOVA gives you an F statistic. So for example, if the, if the t-value is three, the ANOVA is the square of that, so that would be nine. So if t is three, the F test would be nine. If the t is two, the F is four. So, okay. Okay. The so, go ahead. Sorry, just one more thing. So in my study, um, I always go back to my study because it's what I'm the closest to. I looked at two groups, right? Yes. But I could have gone to three groups if I did those who work mostly at home, those who work I, mostly in the office, and then those who split their time evenly. Yes, and I could have could. done a one-way ANOVA to look at those three groups. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's a good example. The ETA coefficient there in cell D3, that is the Pearson correlation between a nominal variable and a uh, continuous variable. And it gives the same, you know, maybe we'll do a present, maybe I'll do another video on comparing the t-test, the point by zero correlation, the one-way ANOVA, and uh, linear regression, and show you how they, you come up with the exact same answers. That would be cool, yeah. So, but that's for another time. Okay. But so the ETA coefficient is the strength of the relationship. Oh, okay, okay. Wonderful. So, I know when we talked about, I'm going back up to group to the second row where we talked about the t-test and the biserial correlation. Yes. Is there, um, I know you've mentioned like with the Kramer's V and the Eta coefficient, those measure the strength of the relationship. Is there not something for this Point box for D2? Yeah. It's the same. It's all variations of the Pearson correlation. So okay. again, you use the 0.10 for weak, 0.30 for moderate, 0.50 for strong. Okay. Very cool. Okay. All right. Let's talk about ordinal scales. Let me fix this real quick. Okay. So cell B four is just like cell D two. Yeah, just flip the other way around. Okay, this is the other. It's the side of the matrix there, and cell C four is just like cell D three. Yep, what we just talked about. Okay, so row four and column D Pearson correlation. This is where you have um, continuous data. Let me go through my quick tutorial on Pearson correlations. Awesome. Pearson correlation looks at the strength of the relationship between two continuous variables. You may remember from stats class back in the day, they'd put up a scatter plot, and then they'd put a line of best fit. And the more the dots cluster on the line, the stronger the correlation. Right. 
Now in the behavioral sciences, there's two patterns we look for. Positive correlation, uh -huh. which you put in your notes the same direction. Negative correlation is opposite direction. Okay. There's, a, there's a positive correlation between how much education somebody has and how much money they make. You have a fourth grade education, you don't make much. High school, you make more. College, you make more. Graduate degree, you make more. As one mm -hmm. number goes up, the other number goes up as well. Pearson correlation, positive correlation, same direction. Yeah. Negative correlation is opposite direction. As one number goes up, the other number goes down. And the relationship that all adults know is the relationship between how much exercise you get and the size of your waistline. I know in my own life, when I get lots of exercise, I slim down. When I don't get much exercise, well, let's just say there's more of me for my wife to love. <laughs> I think all adults know that pattern. Yep. Yep. So positive is same direction, negative is opposite direction. And as I've been saying for weak, moderate, and strong, it's the same thing for the correlations here. Okay. There's also, the correlation gives you a little r. And you may remember from stats class back in the day, little r squared. Mm -hmm. Little r squared is sometimes referred to as the coefficient of determination. Yep. Now, if you did a Google search on the word coefficient of determination, they would say something like percent of variance accounted for. And as I said uh -huh. earlier, I like to replace the word variance with the word reasons. Percent of reasons accounted for. So if we go back to Dr. Clark's study where she's looking at where they work and their level of work engagement, there is a whole lot of different reasons why somebody would have high or low levels of work engagement. Exactly. Her hypothesis was testing where they worked, their location, how much explaining power did that have? So if there was a correlation or a point by serial correlation, I should say, of 0 0.30, 0 0.30 point times 0.30 is 0 0.09 or 9% of the variance or reasons mm -hmm. are accounted for. Said another way, there's a lot of different reasons why they have higher or low work engagement. Right. 9% can be linked to their work location, meaning 91% of the reasons they have higher or low work engagement is due to other factors. Yep. And in a big sample, that strength of the relationship is very important because you'll sometimes you'll look at, you know, if you've got a big sample, you go, oh, it's significant at the 0 0.001 level. You go, hot diggity dog. But then you look at the strength of the relationship, it's only 2%. Right. That ain't good. Yep. All right. So that's Pearson correlation. That's awesome. I'm, as, you're, as you're talking, I'm thinking about the R squared discussions that I had with my methodologist. So for those of you that are watching this, be prepared to have that conversation with your methodologist. Now you understand why they're asking. <laughs> okay. All right. Can we talk so about non-parametric tests? Right. So we're now going to basically contrast row four with row five. Okay. Now row five is what I think of as ordinal-ish things. <laughs> really, really ordinal. Or something that, that's not, doesn't meet the standards for interval or ratio. Maybe okay. if you're doing, maybe it's non-normally distributed. Uh, maybe it's a small sample size. So as we talked about earlier, the t-test compares two groups to see is there are average differences between. The non-parametric first cousin test is the Mann-Whitney test, which gives basically the same answer, particularly in large samples. So two groups, you're comparing t-test, if it's parametric, if it's non-parametric data, it's a Mann-Whitney. Okay. In box C, if you've got 
the one-way ANOVA, the non-parametric equivalent, something called the Kreskel-Wallace test. Yep. Then over in D4, if you don't meet the assumptions for Pearson correlation, you can do it as Spearman. Spearman is sometimes called the Spearman rank order correlation. And essentially what, how that works is for each variable, they rank the scores that people have. So in, in Dr. Clark's, where she's got over 400 people, everybody gets a ranking from one to 400. Mm. And then what happens is they do a Pearson correlation on the ranks. Interesting. And again, it's interpreted uh, a weak correlation is 0.10, moderate correlation is about 0.30, strong correlation is about 0.50. Okay. So that's the presentation of, of what stats win. <laughs>